three days ago, we see Victor fall down to the basement as he lands hard on the ground. He was dazed and felt dry blood all on the ground. As he looked over and saw Trey, Victor then saw two creepy figures coming from the shadows of the basement as two walkers, a mother and son, growled and tackled Trey, pouncing on him. Victor was horrified as they began to devour him. He sees Trey. He screams and struggles, trying to get free, as one of them with a bloody mouth bites into him. He screams as they bite into him. His uniform blocks the biting and nails from the walkers. He breaks free from it and crawls, trying to pull himself up. Victor slowly tries to climb back up the stairs, and as he does, he trips on some of the blood on the stairs and slips, landing on his chest as he rolls back down. Victor gasps, trying to regain his breath. He lays down as he passes out from the immense pain. Some time later, Victor wakes up and sees Trey's corpse. Victor looked on horrified as Trey woke up and started to growl at him. Victor panicked. He wasn't restrained like the other two. Victor tried to get away from him. No, get away! He stated. He tried to climb again, but he was pulled down the stairs, and as he landed on Trey, he quickly got up, avoiding being bitten in the face as he headed for the window. He saw a box and used it to climb up before guarding his elbow. He then breaks the window as the glass falls in. As Trey growled, he grabbed Victor's leg and bit him as Victor screamed. He pried him off of him and kicked him off, knocking Trey to the ground. As the walker tried to get up, Victor held onto his leg and started taking deep breaths. Come on, he said as he jumped and pulled himself out of the window. As he climbed out of the basement, Victor screamed, clenching his ribs. He crawled into the rain. Victor finally was outside, soaked in rain as he gasped for air. He laid on the ground, completely exhausted and in pain as he looked and heard Trey growl past a small broken window. After several moments, he slowly pulled himself up as he looked around, trying to figure out what to do next. At the house, Victor tried to pull the boards off, but they were too strong. You bastard! He cried, clenching his ribs. He couldn't see anything either as he was exhausted, as he walked away from the house, unable to do anything. As he walked in the rain for a while, he looked around before seeing a small random house in the woods. He goes inside and screams freezing. He removes his soaked uniform and sees that it's slightly damaged badly. As he goes inside the house, he walks inside the bathroom and finds a first aid kit. He opens it up and sees only one thing left inside of it. He takes it out, a roll of bandages, and patches himself up. He then hears a walker, but traps it by quickly closing the door. He sighed in relief, not having the strength to move, let alone fight. As the rain continues outside, he lies down on the ground. He then continues to look around and finds several bottles from the closet. He then looks more, finding a bottle of whiskey as he downs all the remaining pills from the bottle before drowning it in alcohol. He then plops himself on the bed as he thinks back to everyone he's lost. He begins to cry, trying to rest. Hours later, at nighttime, he hears the walker again as it wakes him up. He curses and goes to kill it. He struggles to walk. As he does, he opens the door as the walker growls louder at him. He bashes it in the face with his bottle before jamming the remaining piece into its head, killing it. Afterwards, he cries in pain, having moved too much, as he breathes heavily. He then turns to see a dark figure standing across the room from him. The figure spoke, You always needed me to protect you. The voice stated as Victor turned around, horrified. He didn't see anything, though. The person was gone. He then took some cough medicine, drinking the entire bottle before going back to bed. Another day later, Victor tried walking on the road until he started getting flashes and felt woozy. He collapsed, passing out on the road. Hours later, Victor woke up, finding himself in a campsite with some other people. What's going on? Where am I? He asked. Victor was then talking to the leader of the campsite face to face. They had horses and carriages. 
So that's when we found you passed out on the road, the leaders told him. It's a good thing we showed up when we did, because the geeks were right on top of you. We were sure you were a goner, he told him. I'm hard to kill, he stated. That fancy vest of yours must have saved you. What even is that? he asked. Victor looked at his uniform. I found this on the road. Some dead guys were wearing it, he told him. How'd the dead guy die if geeks can't bite through that stuff, he asked. He was shy in the head, Victor told him, indifferent. Later that night at the camp, Victor was sleeping as he tossed and turned multiple times. Thought you always protect me. A sad feminine voice cried out. Victor shouted and shot up as he looked on, terrified at the unknown voice. He was trembling. Hello? He cried out weakly. He looked outside the tent as he began panting. The voice was so familiar. The next day, Victor left the camp carrying a bag of supplies and a gun. He began scavenging in a town when he heard gunfire. He ran back as fast as he could and took cover by the trees as he looked to see the soldiers in black gunning down and taking people from the camp away. He looked and saw that the leader was a reanimated walker as they stabbed him in the head, finally killing him. Suddenly, there was another survivor behind him. These people just showed up out of nowhere and they were on top of us before we could even figure out what was going on, he stated, as Victor looked on. Hey, you're close. Why didn't he look the same? He said, as Victor, without hesitation, quickly slit his throat. The man grabbed his throat, choking on his own blood, as Victor ripped his bag of supplies off of him before walking off into the woods. Behind him, the CRM soldiers took the remaining people into their vehicles and began to drive away down the road as Victor walked in the opposite direction. Johnny and the others looked in horror at the mangled body of Talia and her son Eddie. They growled as the mother and son walkers were buried in a pile of rocks. Everyone was either shying away from the sight or looked like they wanted to throw up. All except Sean, as he stared at this portrait. My God, what happened here? He shouted. Patrick was terrified at the sight of him. Who, who did this? William asked. I don't know. I don't know, but when I find whoever in the hell did it, the sick bastard's gonna die. Peter took his knife and drove a knife into both of their heads. He was very upset. He was crying. After putting them down, he looked at Talia and Eddie's bodies. They were stabbed multiple times, their throats slit and weighed down by the rocks. He tried to analyze them the best he could, while he looked like he was going to be sick. Were you a cop? Patrick asked. I was. I had never worked on homicide before, he told me. Everyone looked on in a mix of horror and sadness as Patrick and Peter talked about what they were going to do now. Do you think there's one of us? Yes. I have my suspicions. I promise you, if one of my own people did this, I will find him, he told him. Later that day, Sean was sitting with Jeff, Chris, Jessica, and their boys. I can't believe someone killed them, she stated. It's not safe here anymore, Chris stated. I talked with Patrick. We're going to leave soon. There's a town where we can get some gas and wait for Manny. After that, we should get out of here. Are you sure that's a good idea? Adrian asked. Splitting us up is risky with a killer out there, he stated. Right now, it's the only option we've got. We're out of gas and need to get a lot if we're going to move everyone out of here as soon as possible. Gas has almost completely evaporated from the cars now, Chris told him. So who's going? Sean asked. I am, Chris stated. Can we come to Dad? Cody asked. No, absolutely not, Jessica stated. Now hold on, honey. The boys are 15 years old. They're not kids anymore, he told her. But it's dangerous, she told him. It's dangerous here. A mother and son were just brutally murdered, he told her. Sean is going with Dad, and he's younger than us, Jordan protested. We've been really practicing our fighting. We're really good now, he told his parents. Please, Mom and Dad, Cody begged. Listen, boys, I can't make you come with me, but if you really think you're ready to come with us, then I'm willing to trust you, he told them. The boys looked at their mother. She was extremely hesitant. 
promise me you'll bring both of them back unharmed? She asked her husband. The boys gave a slight smile as Chris promised his wife. Well, I think you'd be best if we turned in for the night, Adrian stated before getting up and walking in the house. He then sees his girlfriend in the hallway. Hey, are you going to come to bed? He asked. No, I'm keeping watch tonight with some of the others, she told him. Why didn't you tell me? Adrian asked. I forgot after the murders happened, she confessed. Oh, I see. Well, are you sure about this? He asked her. I can handle myself, she told him. I'm just worried about you. I don't want something to happen to you too because I wasn't there to protect you, he stated. I appreciate that. But like I said, I can handle myself, she said back. Okay. All right. So, how are you feeling with everything? He asked. To tell you the truth, I feel sick to my stomach. Somebody killed that woman and her little boy. An eight-year-old boy, she said. It's horrible. I thought we were in a safe group, but I guess no group is ever safe, she said upset. I'll never let anything happen to you, Kat. I promise. I know. But it's not just about me. There are other people in this group besides me. It's everyone else I'm worried about. We have kids here, she told him, annoyed. I have to go. Oh, and William was looking for you, she told him. Why? What's wrong? He asked. He just wanted to see you. He seems down, she told him. Oh, thanks, Kat. Adrian goes to his brother, who looks upset. Hey, Will, are you okay, bro? He asked, seeing his brother was down. What's wrong? He asked. It's just that it's almost been a year now since, since Vincent passed away. He said, rubbing the tears off his face with a sleeve. I just thought about him after what happened. Adrian hugged his brother. I miss him too, he told his brother. But you still have me and mom and dad, he comforted him. Yeah, I know. Thanks, man, he said. Of course, he said, comforting his brother. The next day, everyone was packing up for the trip. As Sean gets his bag, he pats Merle on the head. Hey, Sean. Do you want to come with us? Chris asked. Sean looked over as the boys waved over him. Sure, he says, going with Chris and his family. Merle follows them and jumps in the van. Charlotte hugs her sons as she wishes them luck, while Obadiah approaches Jeff. Hey, friend, you mind if I drive? He asked. Jeff was confused and nodded. No, it's going to be okay. God is still watching us, he said, assuring him. Before we lost our home... Something like this happened to us, he told Obadiah. People from your camp died, or do you mean someone in our group was a killer? He asked. Both, Jeff told him, as he talked about how his own wife and kid named Brandon both died under mysterious circumstances. As they finished talking, they saw that Patrick and the others were ready. Jeff thinks as he starts hearing somebody else's voice in his head. I'm sorry about your son, because I need... To stay here, I have some things to take care of. Do you want to know which one of us got your son killed? Jeff snapped out of it and got into the car as his hand was shaking. They all drove off from the house as Sarah and the others watched from the window. She was sitting inside the house, comforting and watching little Dina. Don't worry, they'll be back. She told the little girl, showed no reaction to what she just said. Sarah looked on at Alexa and Dan in concern. At the facility, we see several CRM helicopters and trucks leaving the facility and go out into the unknown. As they leave the area all armed and geared up, Captain Wells watches before hearing something. Yes, ma'am, I see. Yes, I understand how serious this is for the future of humanity. I just sent them to sweep all the sectors. Yes, I will be sending the rest of the packages to the RF. Thank you, ma'am, he says, hanging up. The captain leaves and heads down the stairs. He takes a key and unlocks one of the doors, revealing a holding area with dozens of cages with people in them. He watches as they took out another person who was drugged before putting them on their knees. He watches on the platform as something growls. In the town, the group park, hide, and stash their cars as everyone gets up. They pick their teams, captains, Patrick, Peter, William, Chris, Adrian, and Obadiah. Sean goes with Jordan as they look around the town. 
Wow, this town is trashed, he says amazed. It's been two years since the world ended, Sean told him. You ever think what's going to happen to all the towns and cities if even more years pass? I mean, imagine 20 years passing, or 30. Sean thinks for a moment. Everything will get overgrown, he told his friend. Exactly. Imagine, like, even the skyscrapers? You think it'll ever get so bad that even those will get covered in vines and plants? He asked. It's very likely. I don't think we're ever going to take back the cities from before, he replied back as they saw several walkers. Chris and the others stepped in in front of them, shielding them from the walkers as the father protected his son. Great, so what, we're just spectators? He asked. You should be grateful that you still have a dad that can protect you. When the time comes to defend yourself, you will wish he was there for you, Sean told him. I didn't say that I don't appreciate him protecting me. It's just, I'm not a kid anymore, he told him. Meanwhile, Benjamin was driving his vehicle as he slowly pulls into the woods. He covers the truck using tree branches to camouflage it as he took all his weapons and back and began to walk off. As he walked by himself for a while, he looked and saw a bridge in the distance. As he looked with his binoculars, he saw that it was heavily damaged and a swarm of walkers all around it. He recognized it as the same one from days ago. He then heard a noise and quickly hid in the forest, ducking by one of the bushes as he saw a car coming. It was one of the CRN trucks. He aimed his gun and watched, but they didn't stop. They drove right past him, confusing him. When it was out of sight, he quickly raced through the trees to follow it. After some time, Benjamin hit again and looked as the soldiers were taking equipment from their trucks and signaling the dead. The swarm growled and followed the soldiers as they lit up the flares and disruption charges, getting their attention. Benjamin continued to watch them in silence, looking through his binoculars. Lieutenant Mitchell takes her walkie. Captain, column status is good. Preparing to drop them off at the site, she told me. She got inside her car, driving off. She and the other soldiers continued leading the dead away from the bridge. He decided to move and ran out of his hiding spot and shoved several walkers. He ducked again in the woods next to the road of the column, as they were calling. Benjamin was going to find out once and for all who these people were and what they were doing here. Elsewhere in the camp, we see Grace and the others continue quietly move and perform tasks in their hidden campsite. As they do their chores, all of a sudden, they hear something. The sound of a vehicle. Kids, hide! Grace shouted as everyone began to hide. Grace and a few of the other women in the camp took a weapon to defend themselves. They looked and saw a van coming their way. It stopped as Grace looked. We're armed! Don't try anything or we'll shoot! She warned them. In the passenger side, somebody stepped out of the car as Grace was shocked. It was Rachel. Oh my god, Rachel! She said, hugging the young girl. I'm so glad you're okay. We were afraid you and the others didn't make. She said, not finishing that sentence. I'm glad you and everyone here made it back t past the bridge. Is everyone accounted for? Rachel asked. Besides you, Tyler, Rebecca, and Benjamin, she said, before turning and seeing a woman with a weird fishing hat on stepping out of the driver's seat. Not long after, two more women were bringing Tyler from the back who didn't look so good. Oh no, Tyler, is he okay? Grace asked. We think he has a concussion, Grace told her. These women found and saved us, she stated. All right, let's get you all inside. We, we can take care of it. She then told them as they all followed her. Sometime later, Georgie was looking over a book, flipping through the pages. She took a break, looking and admiring the camp. Hilda and Midge were being asked questions by the curious other women and children of the camp. Georgie smiled as she gently put her book back inside her bag. 
and started walking around the camp. She looked and saw Rachel sitting down with her back turned. She saw that Rachel was wiping tears from her face as Tyler was lying asleep next to her. Rachel quickly wiped the tears from her face as she was embarrassed. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to disturb you. Georgie apologized. Oh no, it's all right. Rachel said upset. How is your brother? She asked. He's okay. Thank God. It was a slight concussion, she revealed. I'm happy to hear that. I'm sorry to intrude, but I thought perhaps you might enjoy a walk to clear your head. But if you'd rather stay with your brother, I completely understand, Georgie said before Rachel talked. No, that sounds like a great idea, actually. I really think I need one. She stood up and looked at Tyler. I'll get one of the girls to watch him, she told Rachel. Rachel nodded and walked with her. After some time, Rachel continued to walk with Georgie through the woods as they patrolled the border. How are you doing? Georgie asked, breaking the silence. I'm holding on the best I can with everything that's happened. I'm just relieved Tyler is going to be okay. I can tell you have a strong relationship with your brother, she stated. I do. I have to, she stated. What do you mean you have to? She asked back. Our father was never there for him. Neither was our mother, truth be told. So somebody had to look after him. My other brothers couldn't care less if I was being honest, Rachel stated. I admire your strength. I never was very close to my family growing up. I always spent my time reading books, studying people, instead of forming close bonds with them, she revealed. Sometimes... The best way to understand people is to interact with them, Rachel advised. Georgie smiled. Great thoughts speak only to the thoughtful mind, but great actions speak to all mankind, she stated. Is that from Theodore Roosevelt? Rachel asked. Impressive. You know your philosophy, Georgie said, complimenting her. You don't know how many young people I've said that to, and they never got it. It was during the acceptance speech of the Progressive Party, conventional August 6, 1912, over a hundred years ago, he revealed. So you were a professor? She asked. I suppose I gave that away, George smiled. I mean, the well-dressed suit and glasses would be weird if you weren't one. You're surprisingly clean for someone on the road, she said. Thank you. If only the world didn't fall, I could have perhaps had you as one of my students. She stated. I don't think I would have been an Adam Lowell student, she confessed. Why would you say that? Georgie asked. You're kind, well-mannered, strong, and very intelligent for a woman your age. She complimented. Well, before we met, I had someone special in my life. He took care of me. I was always living day by day, rarely taking the time to ever think about myself or what I wanted in life. I was just so focused on what my family needed and how much I could sacrifice for them to make it another day that I didn't have dreams or goals. I was just waking up and being the glue for everyone when I couldn't see that I was damaging myself. I'm so sorry you had to go through that, Rachel. That sounds truly awful. Okay. It was. I thought I didn't deserve to be happy, to be amazing at anything because it's not what the world needed from me, she revealed. But now I know that was just the voices of my father and my brothers and the world putting me down. But even now, I keep failing. And now, I don't know where I'm supposed to go or what I'm supposed to do because I feel like I have something to do or everyone will die. But I'm not a leader, Rachel said, putting herself down. You put too much stress on yourself. You also don't think you're good enough when I get the sense that no one has doubts about you. You have to start believing that some things will just work themselves out. You don't always have to stress yourself out on every single person that you come across in your life, Georgie told her as Rachel listens on. I want to show you something. May we sit down, she asked. Rachel nodded. The two women sat down as Georgie handed her her book from her bag. Open it, she told her. As Rachel looked, she was perplexed. The future? I'm still working on the title. I can't decide if I want it to be the bridge, the future, or the road, she said. 
Rachel opened it up, seeing schematics for a lot of old world inventions, aqueducts, bridges, windmills, water mills, crop rotations, and many other old world inventions. Wow, these are amazing, Rachel stated. Georgie smiled. Thank you, although I can hardly take credit. We've always had these inventions before. I simply simplified and compacted them into a sizable copy. Why do you have this? Rachel asked. Because one day I believe when the dead are all gone, there will be a time where human beings will have to build back up all that they've lost. If we learn from our achievements from the past, but don't repeat the mistakes, I believe that humanity can come together and live. Life can begin anew, she stated. You really think that's possible? Rachel asked. I know it is. Humans are too stubborn to die out, but I can't think of it on my own. All of us need to work together, she stated. What's... what, like me? Rachel asked as Georgie nodded. I'm not like you. I'm not an award-winning book-publishing professor. I'm a lost girl who came from a broken home of five kids, she revealed. Is that you talking or your father and brothers? Georgie asked. Rachel looked back in surprise. Rachel, you have so much potential. I can see it. But I can only guide you on a path of self-improvement. The rest is up to you, she told her. Meanwhile, on the road, Carla and Manny were walking down the road, having run out of gasoline. They killed a couple of walkers with ease. So, you guys fought a group of Vikings? Yes. That's right. They had this weird face paint and everything, she told him. So, like... Did they use actual Viking weapons? He asked. I don't really remember. I mean, I think a few of them had axes, machetes, she told him. So, what happened? He asked. They broke into our home one night when we had our guard down. We had this stupid movie night thing we did. Anyways, they got in and people died. A lot of people, she told him, as Manny looked creeped out. My friend Benjamin snuck into their camp and killed their leader and poisoned all of them. After that, we never had to deal with them ever again. That's crazy. So this Benjamin guy was your leader? He asked. More or less. We all kind of ran the community, but he always made the tough calls and did the hard stuff. Benjamin is also younger than me and John, so he was more impressive, she said. Well, he sounds like a hell of a guy. How old is he? Manny asked curiously. He's 20, she told him. 20? Oh my god, you can't be any older. You don't look a day over 18, he says to her. Carla gave a small smile, but was done answering his question. Okay, now it's your turn. Start from the beginning, she asked. It's a long story, he told her. I've got the time, she told him. Okay, but I warned you. I was born in Alta Bates Summit Medical Center in California on August 1983 from my parents, Eduardo, not that far back, Carla told him. Manny laughed as he continued. Okay, well, long story short, I was a waiter in Chicago when the world ended. I was able to get out of the city because I had no family. I was on my own when Obadiah found me on the road, starving, dehydrated, and about to become dead meat. We eventually met up with some people and they took us to Clayton. He had the suite set up for hundreds of people when the outbreak was happening. He was in the FBI. Unlike the military, they didn't panic when everything went to hell. They isolated themselves in and we kept a lot of people alive. I wonder if they're still there now, he asked. Where is it? Maybe we could Maybe things can be better there now. Maybe things are better now, she asked. Ha! Huh. No way. 
The second we step back there for deserting, they'll kill us. No, the best thing is to just move on, he stated. Carla was surprised. He was a good leader, all things considered. But a lost man is no leader for lost people. Did he have a name? Carla asked. Huh? Did it have a name? Carla asked. Huh? A name? She asked. Oh yeah, Helios. Manny said smugly. Helios? Wow, that's a bad name, she said cringing. Hey, it was a safe place in the world. We didn't want to call it our community something generic, like the tower or something boring. We had tall steel walls, plenty of cover with the trees, power to run everything, plenty of medicine, stockpiles from the agency. It was a perfect place to call home. He was a captain in the FBI and everyone looked up to him. We left because he stopped being a leader who cared about us and started being a leader who wanted to use his people as tools, he revealed. Benjamin's not like that. He puts himself out there for every single person in our group. He protects us no matter the cost, he told him. He's very selfless, he told him. Thought they were a dying breed. Yeah. Too selfless, if you ask me, she stated. Suddenly, then, they were beginning to hear a lot of noise and heard another helicopter. The two of them quickly got off the road and headed into the woods as they looked to see it was them. The CRM were leading a massive horde of the dead behind them with disruption charges in a helicopter just overhead. Carla was blown away at seeing this as they watched the dead follow them like mindless cattle. It's a good thing you left that group because anyone who goes after these guys is either crazy or a dead man, she stated. As they watched, Carla heard something and ducked as bullets flew past them. Manny and her took off sprinting as fast as they possibly could. There they go! A soldier shouted, open fire! Another said, firing his gun. Manny took off sprinting as Carla quickly followed him. Manny ran faster than he ever did in his entire life at that moment. But then things got quiet. He turned around and didn't see Carla anywhere. Carla? He whispered. He slowly walked back, pointing his gun. He looked as several CRM soldiers were all surrounding Carla, holding her at gunpoint. Manny was terrified and slowly began to squeeze the trigger. When the figure was sneaking up behind him, he failed to notice it as it grabbed him, making him fire his gun. He misses his shot as they quickly fire back. Manny shoots the walker in the head and takes off running again. Carla tries to get free as she is tied up by the soldiers. One takes his gun and hits her with it, knocking it her down. In the woods, Manny continues running. He's completely exhausted and pants. Carla, what the hell have I done? He asks. He pants when a tall black figure stands behind him. He turns around as the figure hits him down, knocking him out as everything goes black. He falls down as the soldier grabs his legs and drags him. Later that day, Rachel was patrolling the road all by herself. She was all geared up in her CRM uniform as she walked with guns on her back. As she walked on the dirt road, she saw a walker come from the side and slowly turn towards her and predictably a growl before changing its path and walking to her. She took her gun and activated the blades as the large piercing blades retracted outwards. She then walked forward and jammed her gun right at it, successfully killing it. She pulls her gun back as the walker drops backwards completely dead. She took a deep breath and analyzed how she killed it effectively without much effort. She then walked past it and saw something in the sky. There was a very tall tower in the distance. She looked at it and pulled on her walkie and then got an idea. After a while, 
Rachel was continuing to walk in the woods when she heard something. She then stopped in her tracks, sensing something was off, and turned out, aiming her gun. Wait, don't shoot, it's me! Someone said. Rachel lowered her gun. Oh my god, what are you doing here? She asked. You should be at camp resting, she told him with authority. I'm fine, and besides, do you know how dangerous it out here is to go on your own? He asked. I'll be fine, you have a concussion. A small concussion, he said, holding the bandage to his head. I'll be fine, he told her. I want you to head back right now, she told him. Fine, come with me, he asked. I can't. There's something I need to do first, she stated. So then I'm supposed to head back all by myself, he asked. Rachel signed. I can't go back with you and I also can't let you go back by yourself to camp, she said. Then I guess the only thing you can do is let me come with you, he stated. Rachel knew he was right. She played right into his hands. Fine, but you stay with me. Keep quiet and do exactly as I say, understood? I got it, Tyler said, following her. The two siblings walked together further in the woods to the faraway tower. As they were walking, Tyler spoke up. So, are those women staying with us for good? Are they joining? He asked. I don't know, but they seem decent enough, he told him. I don't trust them, he stated. They saved both of our lives, she said back. Yeah, but they're not strong. Not like Benjamin, he said as he looked as she looked upset at the name. I'm sorry. He's out there. He'll come back, Tyler stated. I know, Rachel confirmed. They then saw the tower. Here it is, she said tired. Rachel and Tyler walked over the sign and saw the warning and caution sign for the ranger station. They then turned around and seeing a dozen walkers behind them, Come on, she told him. We got a long climb up. The siblings walked all the way to the top. After a hundred or so stairs, they crawled to the last few as Rachel and Tyler were exhausted. They sat down, trying to catch their breaths. Rachel looked at her brother. Are you okay? She asked, feeling his head. You feel okay? She helped him inside the station before closing the door and locking it. Tyler sat up. I'm okay. Just a little lightheaded. So are you going to tell me why we're here? He asked. Rachel pulled out her walkie. I figured the station would be the best place to send a signal out to Benjamin and Carla, she said. Don't do it, Tyler warned her. The station probably has the best radio signal for a hundred miles. It's our best chance, she told him. Our best chance for what? Those Nazis in black to find us? No, it's way too dangerous. What if they track the signal back here and find our camp? He asked. It, it's a risk I have to take, she told him. No, it isn't. Please, Rachel, think for a second, he begged. I don't want to lose you too, he cried. Rachel stopped touching the radio and looked to her brother. She, she's, she's gone, he cried. It was my fault. I never should have told Rebecca that she should have died the same night we lost our brothers. She would still be alive if I didn't say that, he cried. Rachel tried to hug her brother, but he pushed her back. I'm so sick of this. Everything just keeps getting worse and worse. We lose our friends. We lose our home. Soldiers attack us. B Benjamin is gone and Rebecca is dead, he cried. I can't do this anymore, he cried. It hurts. I hate being alive, he cries. Rachel hugs him. Tyler, I know you're hurting. I'm not dealing with it any better than you. It hurts just as much for me. It hurts like hell. My heart feels broken. It actually hurts every day that Rebecca's gone. I was supposed to protect you two. You two are my whole world, and I failed you. I love you so much. 
Everything I did was to protect you and Rebecca from Dad and from Damien and the world. I can't do it on my own. I'm tired. I'm weak. No matter how hard I sacrificed, how hard I tried, she still slipped through my hands. I'm so sorry, but please, Tyler, don't give up. Don't do this for me. Do it for yourself. You are so important. She told me. You and Benjamin got letters from her. I never did. I never got to say goodbye. You and Benjamin got letters from her. I, I never did. I never got to say goodbye to her. He cried. I wanted to say so much more to her. He told Rachel. She knew, Tyler. Rebecca knew how much you, you loved her. I took care of you two since I was little. And she was glad to have you. You were the only brother who truly cared for her. I know you said things you didn't mean to. Everyone makes mistakes. But Rebecca never held a grudge to you, she told him. Tyler cried and smiled a little. I love you, Rachel, he said. I love you too, she cried, hugging him tightly. After they hugged, they go outside to get some air. Oh man, that's a long way down, he tells her. It is, but luckily the tower is stable enough, she told him. They stand there as they see the amazing view. Wow, Rachel says in complete shock. While the sky was quiet and the trees were dark green, they felt a cold breeze from the stormy air. Wow, what a view, Rachel said. Yeah, from up here the world doesn't seem like hell, he says. Do you ever wonder what flying would be like, he asked. Just flying all over this and never needing to touch the ground where the dead always are, he asked. Must be nice, Rachel said, sounding jealous. Soaring through the air without... Wait, Tyler! Rachel got his attention. Do you hear something? She asked. Rachel quickly gets her bag and pulls out some binoculars and looks through them. What? What is that? He asked. Rachel continues to look and in her viewpoint was a black helicopter in the sky. Oh my god, she said astonished. Tyler looked on hearing. That sounds like a helicopter! He said amazed. Rachel continued to look as the helicopter was lowering itself to some sort of roof in the far distance. It's them, Rachel said angry. What do you think they're doing? He asked. I don't know, Rachel says. But we're going to find out, she replies back. In the town, Sean and the others continue scavenging in the vehicles for gas as Jordan pulls out a mask from his bag. What do you think? He asks as the mask is a replica of Jason. That's a better look for you, Sean told him. Ouch! He laughed. Where'd you even find that? Sean asked. In the costume store, he told him. Which store? Sean asked. The one over there, Jordan said, pointing in the distance. Sean turned the corner and looked. Chris was holding a gas can and saw the boys in the distance. Hey boys, stay close to me, all right? That's too far out, he told him. Sean looked. You go back. He's not my dad. He said, walking away as Moral closely followed him. Jordan looked on and listened to his dad as Sean looked, seeing that something on the wall was red. Sean went further to get a closer look. Sean, where are you? He cursed, following him. Chris handed the gas can to someone as he looked back to see that the boys were gone. Oh no, he said. Sean stood there, not moving, as Jordan caught up to him. Hey man, what's the big idea running off like that? He asked. Sean looked at the wall as it said in a massive spray paint. Rachel, Carla, I am alive. It's Benjamin. It's my brother. He was here! Sean said excited. We have to find him! Come on, we have to tell the others! He shouted. As the boys ran, the group had several people through their scopes in eyesight. As in the woods, a squad of CRM soldiers was perched, waiting and aiming their rifles at them. Eyes on the hostiles, captain awaiting further orders, the lieutenant said. More CRM soldiers went besides him, aiming their rifles. Multiple targets, 21 and counting, he stated. Fire when ready, the walkie said. 
on my mark. Three, two, one. Ah! 